of everyone in our lives. Dear loving God, you have created us and you still sustain our lives. What a joy. What an opportunity. We're still learning about it all, but we already rejoice. And at each stop, we get ever more enthusiastic, reframing difficulties and obstacles, and finding out in each and in every one of them a renewed opportunity to renew ourselves, to acquire virtues unimagined. So thank you for creating us. Thank you also for creating us for infinite possibilities. Possibilities that we are yet to discover and we understand that with you, there's no regress. There's always progress and the awaited happiness. The kingdom of yours. So may tonight we nourish ourselves with your loving care. Feel your providence and allow your messengers to calibrate us so we can fulfill your will on earth as it already is in heaven. May you grant us the permission to begin this therapeutic meeting under your protection and indispensable guidance. And so be it. Okay, so we have a special cri special Christmas lesson for the children. You're going to enjoy it. Miss Luciana, Miss Carol. Okay, see you soon, friends. Enjoy. For us, spiritists, we, do we celebrate Christmas? Well, it depends what it is to celebrate Christmas, right? If it is about exchanging gifts, I mean, we can do it. That's okay. There's no prohibition. But it's about celebrating the coming of Jesus. That's a sure thing, right? We, we rejoice, don't we? We rejoice. What would be our lives without Jesus? no joy that's how the world was joy was filled with wine and still is <laughs> but we have much more than that so the joy that we're talking about here is deeper than that but with jesus oh finally forgive me i have to push the radios button too Okay. Joy for sure. If we were 
sick at Jesus' time? How did people see us? They saw us as being punished by the gods. When you read the book 2,000 years ago, you can go to heavy-duty history, but if you want a shortcut and add more element, even more fun, 2,000 years ago, 50 years later with Emmanuel. Beautiful, beautiful. And if you, if you know um, the book, it's a beautiful book to read during the season, the holiday season. And if you want, you can, if you listen to things in Portuguese, there is the famous audio novellas, very professionally done. And you can listen to the whole thing. So it's very, be it's as if you are watching a movie. We look forward to having it at Kardec Radio in English. We already have the script. Yeah, the friends in England did uh, the play in the year 2000, so they lend us. They allow us to use it, and all we need to do is to produce it. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah, easy as that. But who knows, 2020 is coming, and uh, we may produce it to have people. It's a good thing. But as we are saying, it shows to us at the time, if you were sick, people looked at you as if you were being punished. If you were poor, you were also being punished. If you were, if you were of a different, uh, if you didn't have influence and power, so the gods are not favoring you. It's being looked at from the view of privileges. Jesus came and said, you know what, guys? Blessed are the afflicted. And people are like, what? Blessed are the afflicted. To date, it's puzzling to us. Read Kardec's book, the third book by Kardec, The Gospel According to Spiritism. Of all the chapters, the longest is chapter 5. Because it's the chapter that discloses the ins and outs of that beatitude. Blessed are the afflicted, because we are on the earth. On earth, says Leon Denis in the book After Death, pain is law in your world. So when I see somebody saying, oh, nothing goes right in my life, where do you think you're living? Disneyland. <laughs> Because if you are, you can be upset. Because there anything happens and everything happens. Out of Disneyland, it's just a normal world. And as one spirit author said and wrote in a poem through Chico Xavier, the world is not a beautiful garden. I mean, the world where we're in, we need to teach our kids and teach ourselves. It's about a school. It can be beautiful, but a school is about learning, applying ourselves, and going through tests. If we are trained in that mentality, I will wake up and say, what is the learning of today? Oh, it didn't happen. Oh, it failed. Okay, try again until we get there. And Spiritism explains it all. So Jesus is the one that changed the way we see life. He said, you need to broaden your horizon because God loves you. And when God loves you, which is unconditional, there's only a beautiful destiny awaiting us. That's why hope, always. Emmanuel says in the preface of the book, Hope and Light, hope, is the divine stimulus, and I will just uh, add it to make a shortcut, pointing out to future progress. And he says, hope depends on understanding and waiting. Some people say, I don't want to be optimistic because what if things don't happen the way I expect? I'll be frustrated. I don't want to be disappointed. That's a lot of pride, huh? Oh la la, I don't want to be disappointed as if I, 
I am a king that I need to have all my wills fulfilled. If not, I'll give a tantrum. No. Well, if I get disappointed, it's a sign that what I want is not exactly what is supposed to be wished for. So I need to refrain. Like Joseph of Egypt, the governor, ancient times before Moses. And you can watch a Disney movie about it. It's a beautiful story. Because he was the youngest in a family. And he had, uh, let's say, powers. He could uh, understand, interpret dreams. So his father was very protective of him and said, no, you, you don't need to do the manual work. You were born for much more than that. So I want you to stay here and study, etc. And the brothers were jealous. And he was very youthful. <laughs> so he, uh, in a way, he teased the jealousy of the brothers, saying, oh, you see, I dreamt that we were you were this and I was that. So one day the brothers got together and said, you know what, we're so upset with you. They sold him as a slave. But they told the father that he was eaten <coughs> by the wolves. The father was disheartened. But he was not. He was sold as a slave. The destiny led him to slavery and then in jail, like in the prison. In a prison in Egypt close to the pharaoh of the time. His abilities, mediumistic abilities to understand dreams and interpret dreams were still very much there. So he used to talk to the guards and interpret their dreams. But for him it was so hard. For more than a decade he went through the process of not understanding. How come? My father believed in my destiny. Look, I'm different. So much pride in us, right? And one day in prison, because he was from the Hebrew tradition, the Jewish religion, he understood that God is above everything. So he surrendered and said, God, I don't know. You know more than I do. That was the turning point. When he understand that what he thought was right was not aligned with God's purposes. From that day on, he just served, talking to the guards, etc., until the Pharaoh had a dream that was very puzzling. And the guard said, you know, there's a guy there that can help you out. Well, bring him here. He comes, interprets the dream. It's a big deal for the nation, for the empire. He says, you know what? You're so wise, I'm going to make you governor of this whole thing. Very smart, very intelligent. So his father was right. He was destined for much more. He was a missionary. He is considered to be a prophet. He then helps the whole country to shift things around and during the next 14 years, live in abundance and then in great misery, but they survive. And that's when his family comes back. He forgives his brothers. And the rest is history because after him comes Moses and everybody else. So he prepared the grounds for what we call in spiritism, the first revelation. When we go to the book Genesis in the first chapter, character of the spiritist revelation kardec explains to us that spiritism is just a natural unveiling of natural events that have been happening on earth for millennia and we see later on with emmanuel in the book and on the way to the light through chico xavier how he explains to us what kardec just prepared as a foundation in the book Genesis, 
showing the history of humankind since its formation from a spiritist perspective. The same history facts that we know now with the behind the scenes that many people didn't know. And then we understand so many things, especially about ourselves. So when Jesus comes, he comes and says, joy is the next thing, hope. But to achieve it all, we need the courage. Courage to change, to transform. Courage to co-create. God has not created us to be passive beings. He said, he's a conductor of an orchestra. And we have to sing, dance, play. And he keeps conducting. And he wants us to do it all with him, co-creating. Like a pilot and a co-pilot. God is always the pilot. Because <sighs> it's not easy, the responsibility, right? <laughs> it's my... Oh, man. A lot of responsibility. But God is always the pilot, and we are simply the co-pilots. But what if the co-pilot doesn't do his share? Is it a problem? Yes. Can he complicate things? Oh, yeah. Not only for him, for everybody who is involved. So Jesus comes and teaches us in so many ways. And today, to understand it all, we're going to go through a route we haven't explored much. Usually, we attain ourselves to Jesus' verbal teachings. Today, to understand it all, we'll go to the nonverbal lessons, which is ever more powerful. It's based on a study we've done since the year 2011. For the past seven, eight years, studying books such as 2,000 years ago, 50 years later, Hail Christ, um, Jesus in the home that you know. I'm just saying the ones that are read in English. Good news, especially good news. We have information about something that people barely pay attention to. And in a way, it's frontier in science nowadays. If you go to the field of neuroscience, one of the new areas is the neuroscience of emotional body language. As a neuroscientist and a psychologist, it's one of the fields I've been studying and I've been researching upon. So Jesus didn't teach us only by words. Actually, he taught us more by nonverbal lessons than words. Words were complementary. How can you imagine a loving master without a hug? without a compassionate look, without a smile, joy, and then people always look at Jesus at the cross. But that's not the Jesus we're talking about. We're talking about somebody who is the example of joy. So can you imagine the real Jesus? Maybe somewhere in those lines. People barely think of Jesus this way. When you think of Jesus, what comes to your mind? Because at the end of the day, we process things in images, not words. So when you think Jesus, how do you see? Angry at you? That's not Jesus, I'm sorry. We've never, re we've never heard a report on that. One that is like judgmental, not Jesus. Because he comes to give us the good news. Spiritism is the only philosophy on earth that systematically brings a report of these nonverbal lessons. If you look at the Bible, we don't have much information. Also because we didn't have that much vocabulary for such things. Now, with the expansion of our intellectual capacity and vocabulary and understanding of the human mind, through the good spirits, we have reports such as, we'll give an example, just out of 
delight. It's very surprising. Jesus comes in that very scene. Invited John and James to the apostleship. They are by the beach. He comes and invites them in. They are very excited. They come. And Umberto de Campos through Chico Xavier reports on something we didn't know. So we, could, we can visualize in the book Good News. Boa Nova. They report. John and James came, kissed Jesus' hand. And Jesus, what did he do? Was he like this? <laughs> but that's not a master of love, right? It doesn't match, like, come with me, let's go. <laughs> like we see some gurus nowadays. They are distant from everybody. They don't hug, they don't approach, they don't eat, they have special diets. Thank God Jesus didn't do any of this. And Chico Xavier, who really followed his footsteps, never promoted any diet. Because what we put here, here in the mouth doesn't matter, Jesus said. What comes out matters. Thank God Chico Xavier didn't promote a diet of this, a diet of that, and Jesus didn't either. Because that doesn't matter. What matters is what we feel, what we say, what we do, what we think. I mean, diets are important to sustain the body. But we're talking about immortal acquisitions. There are many people who are vegans, and they are probably more cruel than people who are meat lovers. We know that Hitler was vegetarian. Sorry to say. I'm not discouraging vegetarianism. We think it's a good thing, plant-based diet scientifically proved to be healthy but that's not going to be defining our moral virtue and Jesus didn't do it so what does he do when the two come with with him it's very impressive because I can do it here right <laughs> they are kissing and he is caressing the curls of John's hair And then people would be, imagine a Hollywood movie, people would pause and say, oh, you can almost imagine the next thing people would say, right? <laughs> 2,000 years ago. But it's a master of love and kindness. What would you expect? And often he's smiling. So we're going to show in studies of these books that Jesus is, has non-verbal lessons for us that if we observe that quote we may be more coherent in our lives consistent and much happier much happier we'll talk about this but before we go there we need just to revisit three main points right daisy mm -hmm. about jesus who he is for us because if we don't go over this we won't be able to understand his nonverbal lessons okay so this is gonna help us revisit those before we go through the study of his nonverbal lessons okay Daisy hi good evening friends so as we are approaching Christmas and thinking and learning and studying with Jesus, we want to recap three points. Um, who was Jesus, right? We talk so much, um, you know, we, you know, in our daily lives, right? Like we hopefully think about Jesus, but Spiritism brings this new approach and this new way for us to look at Jesus. So we brought three, cap three points here to recap. And we're going to walk through them together. So the first one is Jesus has the real man. So what does that mean? Right? The real, he's the man, right? If we have to say. But I'm not saying here man in the way of the, the masculine, but the humanity, the real. There's a message, a beautiful message in the book Living Spring. It's called Real Humanity. 
and Jesus is the real humanity. So what is that for us? So I'm going to bring a, a chart study, their spirits book. Um, if you don't have the spirits book at your home, we highly recommend it. It don't be, you know, taking off because of its size, but it's very didactic and you can go in and you can, there is questions and answers. So any questions, anything you can think about, you know, what is death? You know, where is my body? Where, where I'm going? It's all here and Kardec beautifully bring this to us. So today we're going to walk through, okay, so if real, if Jesus is the real deal for us, so how does that work? So if we go all the way back in the spirits book, we learn spirits, we are created simple and ignorant. So all of us here, when we were created, were created simple and ignorant. And then through internships, real internships in matter, through the mineral kingdom, to the plant kingdom, to the animal kingdom, we go through evolution. We evolve, we're evolving beings until we get to the human level. But even when we get to the human level, there are steps like in a ladder that we slowly, as we reincarnate and reincarnate, we progress. So where are we, right? We're probably asking ourselves, where are we in this ladder to progress? Do you think you're there yet to be the real deal? So, we learned that, and we know we're not perfect yet, but Jesus was. Jesus was, has um, Kardec summarizes here for us in the Genesis. Him was nothing more than a superior spirit, one of the highest order. So what is he referring to? So if you go to the spirits book, um, it's part two, chapter one. We learned that there are orders of evolution of spirits. Imagine like a letter starting with imperfect spirits. That's us, right? All of us in this room. And, but what are they? Imperfect spirits. We're gonna get there to Jesus, but let's understand. And I'm gonna just bring a few highlights here for us. Predominance of matter over spirit, a propensity towards evil, ignorance pride, selfishness, and the evil passions that results from them. So are those words news for us to our planet? Ignorance, pride, selfishness? I don't think so, right? There are great things out there. We should be focused on the good, but our planet is still in very this mold. And this is all of us. We're in perfect spirits. We're not there yet. Um, but as we go through these internships in matter and we start to open our minds, you know, to get out the veil, we start to evolve. So what is the next step? The next step is good spirits. So let's go there and let's see what are the characteristics. And there are subcategories. These are the main, like the big buckets. So go to the spirits book and read and study yourself right? It's for all of us here. Um, you know, telling myself, go in, s study, so you can identify where you are, right? Um, good spirits, second order. So not there yet, but predominance of the spirit over the matter, desire to do the good. These spirit's qualities qualities and abilities to do good are in proportion to the degree of advancement they reach. Some possess scientific knowledge, while others display wisdom and benevolence. The more highly evolved ones combine knowledge with moral qualities. So throughout our history, if you look, we can identify those who really came, who were already at that level. Those who you look and you see, yes, they are good spirits, right? We. I know we talk here about Chico Xavier, but even outside of spiritism, you can talk about Buddha, Mahatma Gandhi, Mother Teresa, right? Those are qualities of spirits who came and they were at that level. 
But the beauty of it all, and we were teaching the children last week about this, because the children are already learning about this inside. So they're actually even ahead of us because they can really capture this. And one of the educators shared with us that one of the children watching the cartoon, they had to identify, you know, a good spirit, an imperfect spirit. And then they said, yeah, that superhero, she has good qualities, but she's also jealous sometimes. So they are good, right? They wanted to do good, but they still have the features like Kardec is telling us here, right? So the children can already tell, that's amazing, right? That's why they are really the next generation. But who was Jesus if he was the highest one, right? Let's get there. I know I'm getting there. Okay, let's go. Pure spirits. That's where we want to go, right? We want to get to the pure spirit state. And that's Jesus, highest order. No influence from matter, absolute intellectual and moral superiority in relation to the spirits, uh, to the spirits of others around. So let me read it again. No influence from matter. At this state, Kardec explains to us the spirits, they are not required to go through uh, an incarnation anymore. They are already perfect. They do come like Jesus for a mission, but they, they don't. They are already at the highest level. So he, Jesus, was the real man. In spirit, as we learn that it's not that Jesus was a God, you know, or something that we think about as, oh, yeah, Jesus, that's Jesus, you know, it's not me. No, it's going to be, hopefully, it will be for sure, one of us, hopefully sooner than later, we will get there. So it's not that we are aiming for something that's non-achievable, right? We're going to get there one day, hopefully sooner than other, sooner than later. So Kardec continues explaining the second point here. His superiority over men was only of the spiritual nature. So he's saying, in other words, he's like each and every one of us. He was just at a higher level. But at this state, he had absolute control over matter. And as we discussed last week, right, Jesus didn't get sick, right? He had so much control over matter. You don't hear about Jesus getting, oh, I'm sick or I'm, I'm tired, right? The apostles and him would can you imagine traveling and walking and there were no cars no electricity no 7-elevens no mcdonald's right <laughs> it's in the, i don't know if they had a donkey or not at the time but that was it right they had to go right have you seen the roman shoes at that time it's like it's the sandals that's all they had and there were no asphalt you know they had to walk in the dirt so you don't hear so Picture yourself, a spirit of that caliber coming in, going through the simplest ways of life, right? Don't living with, you know, the apostles, like, and that's really showing to us that we can do it. We, yes, we have the comfort of material things nowadays, but we, he showed us we didn't need it. And science already show us nowadays that this control over matter, how we can really have an impact over our own selves through our thoughts, through our feelings, right? We talk a lot about Louise Hay here, and it's true. Um, and his very spirit was the most refined of earthly fluids. But the main message for us here, friends, is that he was direct a messenger from God. In the book, On the Way to the Light, that Vanessa was sharing with us, we learn that Jesus was one of the spirits who was there when they were planning the formation of our planet, of planet Earth. So, um, what, 4.5 billion, billion years ago, when planet Earth was formed, he was already a pure spirit. And he was there. So can you imagine that's your graduation? <laughs> you graduate, you're pure speed. Okay, so here, let's take care of a planet, a whole planet now. So he, in spiritism, we learned that he's the government, government, government 
of our planet. So he's there, he's taking care of us. So he had the mission to come incarnate on earth. So he went through this process like us, suffering, struggles. He went through all of this, not here on planet earth, but he did and he came has he has the main government of our planet came to show us what is to be not god but the real humanity on earth but we also learn that has the government of our planet he is our guide and model so again back to the spirits book here question 625 what is the most perfect example that God has ordered as a guide and model for us? Vanessa has a neuroscientist. She's always reminding us that um, for us, we need to kind of like a mirror. So we need to look at others so that we can evolve, right? So for example, your, our children, right? We want to give them the example. You can say, you can say, you can say, but if you do the opposite, they're going to they're not gonna copy what you're saying, right? They're gonna copy what you're doing, right? So he, we need that example. And for us is Jesus. So you see the answer is, is, is one word, is Jesus. It's one word that says so much for us in spiritism. Because if we are at any point of our lives where we feel conflicted and we don't know what to do and we need to make decisions, or, you know, we don't know what's next. Remember, who is our guide and model? Jesus. So ask yourself, and I ask myself, what would Jesus do? You know, and if you're really truthful to yourself, because it's hard, right? The answer sometimes is not what we want to do or we think is the right thing. But if you follow that, I'm sure that you're not gonna go wrong because he is our guide and model. And he came to show us in a very humble way. So can you imagine, get to this stature of being a pure spirit and he said, no, I wanna incarnate on earth to show them, to guide them. And there is, in the, in the bottom of these questions, there is just an additional explanation that Kardec adds, the spirits adds uh, through Kardec. God offers him to our thought has our most perfect model. He was the purest being who has ever appeared on earth. So this also clarifies for us that yes, we do have several messengers as Vanessa was saying, those who came before and after Jesus to prepare the grounds for us, but he was the real deal. Sorry to say it that way, but he was the real deal. And he came because he was the most high order spirit to ever incarnate on earth. But he also, as Vanessa was mentioning, was loving and caring and humble. And we have this expression we use, Jesus has a median and has a psychotherapist. Um, has a medium because if you go to the book Genesis, you read that he was a healing medium. He performed miracles, healings, right? As we read and we encourage you to go and read about the, the, the healings that he performed. And sometimes all the person had to do is to touch the cloth, you know, his, um, um, the robe. robe, yes. They, that's all they did. The, there is a beautiful passage that the woman, he was passing by, she touched him and she was healed. But we learn that he gave us the recipe, right? If, we, if you go out on the street and you ask, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be cured? I'm sure majority of people say, yes, yes. But he gave us what is the recipe. First, he says, he asks, right? Do you want to be here? Because we can say it through our mouths. Oh, yeah, I want to be here. But do you really want? Because that requires effort. It's like going to a doctor, 
right? We have doctors here. You go to a doctor and the doctor says, oh yeah, you had a heart attack. So now you have to change your diet, you know, exercise, eat healthy. Hopefully people will go back and do that, but others, they don't. So yes, he was a medium of God, but he says, you will be healed when, you know, so many people saw Jesus. Can you imagine the most perfect being to incarnate? People could be right in front of him and they wouldn't be healed. And we have Judas has the example, right? He was there by Jesus' side, but he still couldn't see. So he brings this to us to say, you, you have the power and it's on you. But he was also a psychotherapist. And a psychotherapist in a way here, and this is, you know, the root of the word terapeu, which means heal, wait upon, and serve, right? It's so beautiful. Um, where he was there, he was caring, right? He would listen to people. He was really, and he still is for us, uh, our psychotherapist. So. If you don't have the money to go to a very expensive psychotherapist, there is a free session <laughs> that you can go and you and he can be your psychotherapist. And all of us has Vanessa who is gonna show to us through his body language, um, through no, his nonverbal lessons, he taught us so much more of being you know, he's there, he's ready to listen, he's ready to help us. Um, but as Matthew said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. So, and Vanessa remind us about a whole chapter in the gospel according to the spirits that says, you know, yes, it's gonna be hard, Jesus told us, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna hurt. Um, and he said, I can go you to you with the whip or with a gentle spirit. So it's on us if we want to go through pain or through love. Most of the times it's through pain, right? But he's there, he's supporting us, but he's showing us that he did it and then we can also do it. So we're gonna continue now learning more about his emotional body language. It's so good to recap the extent of Jesus' nature and approach and his roles so much broader than we have been taught for many reincarnations. But he said, one day I'll be able to tell you what I can't tell you now. And Spiritism comes to reveal to us these so many other facets that even science nowadays are coming to similar conclusions. So, what have he taught us that are beyond words? So many things. We don't have enough time to go through deeply, so it's a teaser. If we wanna know more, I'll give you one tip. Usually when we read these books, like for example, Jesus in the home, short chapters, it's a gathering, there's Jesus' message. Usually we read the message and we don't pay attention to the descriptions that come in between. When they say, oh, they were seated, people were arguing, but Jesus was quiet. Oh, that's a lesson. You think he was quiet just because? He came as a Messiah, as a complete master. At any given moment, he's teaching us with or without words. We have been studying his words and that's where we've created a lot of dissensions. He said reincarnation. No, he didn't say. He said to be born again through water. No, he didn't mean that. Okay, so let's study things that are beyond the scope of interpretation of words. Let us observe the behavior. Let us observe the in between the lines, his silence. So if you go to a field of science that is still very new, 
It's called Neurobiology of Emotional Body Language. It's the study of how we process in our neurobiology the communication of the body. So the emotions that are expressed in the body. So many people believe that emotions are somewhere out there. That's a, what we call a Cartesian view of emotions. Descartes used to think that our emotions are private mental episodes somewhere out there. And thank God we had Darwin. Darwin was much more than the man who brought us to understanding of physical evolution. He was the first one to report on how much body and mind are interconnected, especially through emotions. You see, I will show you some of his drawings. So this is a study, part of the study we've been doing, showing to us, as science says, that our bodies express emotions, so it's emotional body language, that will influence others. Funny enough, huh? if uh, it's, I'll, I'll make just a game, huh? a game. I won't say a word. I'll make a face and you tell me what emotion is probably behind the scenes, okay? What is that surprise? You see, I didn't say anything. Okay. <laughs> And now, see, you didn't say anything. Not only you guys knew it, but if we had here a measurement of our skin conductivity, which is a physiological measure, we would probably say how much you felt what you saw. It's what the scientists call synchronicity, physiological synchronicity. There are scientific papers already showing physiological synchronicity. Think about a family. You are there thinking, I'm not saying anything, I'm not doing anything. Mm -hmm. That's what you think. We, we don't need to talk about spirits. High spirits, low order spirits. We're talking about just incarnates. Just amongst us, we're influencing each other more than we imagine. You remember your parents, right? They were there minding their business and you're like, I think my mom's upset. Why? Because she's mad. She's screaming. Oh my God, I'm going to hide. No, but you bet that she's more upset with your dad than with you. <laughs> <laughs> Classic, or vice versa. I think dad is frustrated. I think he doesn't like me. Very common, children feel this. I think dad doesn't love me. Why? Because I see here the frown face. Oh, really? I'm talking about the language of children. And you ask them, why? But you talk, Dad, what's happening? Oh, I'm so worried about work. The children don't know because we're so self-centered. Many emotions we bought into from our parents, grandparents, teachers, adults, we introjected based on our interpretation and usually we missed the mark because now as adults we see that we feel so many things just beyond the children around. They don't know. But they think it's with them. We influence them. And that means responsibility. But we also influence each other as adults. As an employer, we go to our company as a colleague, people feel like, who cares, nobody notices me. I'm going to sit down and mind my business. So I remember this colleague at work somewhere where I worked. And then we had this adorable lab assistant. And he used to save money. Smart. Now he's a physician, has a family. He knew how to save money. So because he needed to do the saves, he would eat every day peanut butter jelly sandwich. He used to bring the whole thing, keep in his drawer, everything. So he would walk and not even go anywhere. 
do the sandwich, eat. <laughs> so I remember this other postdoc passed the hours because the postdocs used to say, stay longer. She said, I, I want to sneak in and see. I can't believe he eats that every day. <laughs> and he said, why do you care? Why does it bother you? Are, are you eating his sandwiches? But for her, she felt like she was eating the sandwiches. <laughs> but that's how we influence. And he was adorable, very easygoing, sometimes goofy, very simple. And she was not even close to him, but she was upset that he could be so disciplined in saving and doing this just peanut butter jelly sandwich. So nutritious. He survived. He made a family. He has two children. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, it got on her nerves. We influence one another in things we least imagine the idiosyncrasies of each person. So science says, true, emotional body language is perceived as means of influencing others according to social psychology. If you want to study more about this, <clears throat> by President Obama's photo book of his presidency, they released, it's a beautiful table book. But if you flip the pages that the photographer took, there are no words, no text, but you can read the messages that he's sending. If you want to boost your capacity to perceive people's emotional body language, turn off when you're on Facebook, social media, TV, turn off the volume and just watch things without words. And see how you're feeling, what you're capturing. It's deeply powerful. And then you're teaching the brain to perceive more than the words can teach. And one day be masterful in even bringing it out the way you want people to perceive. And as a, a behavioral scientist, I say President Obama is one of the role models on earth in coherence between message and emotional body language. He is really masterful. This is beyond politics. He is a master, congruent, and the output is always matching what he said. Unbelievable. Very impacting. So Darwin, these are some of his drawings. He was the first one to observe that both humans and animals are able to express emotions through the bodies. And that's, he says, unlike Descartes, he understands his own definition that emotions are adaptive to the organism's survival. So emotions are a sign of how we are adapting to the world. So when people are afraid, you can say, I don't want to feel afraid. No, no, no. What is this fear telling you? That the way we're seeing inevitably is going to break us break it down as threat and fear is just the next thing so we can then revisit the perception to change the emotions emotions are never wrong never so we can stop the cycle of being angry at feeling angry being sad or feeling sad, right? Some people are like, I'm so angry, I hate it. <laughs> what do you do? You just, it's a double, double spark. Doesn't work. 
you cool down the flames with something else, the reframing of it all. That's why we need a mirror, a person to coach us and Daisy showed to us. So in neuroscience, we learn that we have the ability that is inbuilt. God made us this way and scientists observed this in the first decade of the 21st century, showing to us that w as we see people, we feel alike and have stimulated similar areas. That's why you don't like to see homelessness. It's like awkward. You go home and you feel like, right? When you go home, you feel like poor and dirty and terrible. And they are kind, many of them. It's nothing to do with them. But what our brain is capturing, it's activating similar areas. But when we see the people from Hollywood, <laughs> hmm, we see a movie with all those cars, high heels, and we look at ourselves in the mirror and we feel it, like we're going to do the, the walk in the red carpet, right? <laughs> you feel it, you feel it. And that's nothing against the nature, it's in your favor, but we need to work for our own benefit. That's we are, why we like to see beautiful things. God made us this way. God made us to gravitate to harmony, beauty, justice, good. We can't blame God. It's a wonderful plan. But what if we find this harmony? We're gonna do what the monkey did. Tongue out. He did too. <laughs> no words. And this is us with our parents and educators, our children with us, our educators, our students. They do it, we do it. And then we're like, why am I doing this? It's just like that person. And you start sometimes with accents. It's so funny. You start being around people who have a certain accent and Soon after, you feel like you have the same exit. Like, oh my gosh, I'm speaking the same way. What's happening to me? Well, ask God, because God made you that way. <laughs> so that's why Jesus said, you need to pay attention to your company. So as Daisy said, we have a guidance model, Jesus. He's the guidance model. If we focus on him, beautiful. What an accent. Zero accent. <laughs> nobody has ever heard he had an accent. Right? Everybody, nobody has ever heard that he only talked to people who spoke his language. So when I see immigrants that are stuck about learning a new language, do you believe in Jesus? So imitate Jesus. Because Jesus was open-minded. When you read the description of the dialogue between Jesus and Publius Lentulus, Publius Lentulus was Roman. Jesus was Hebrew. He, our dear Publius Lentulus as a senator was puzzled for the fact that he was listening, probably in another language, but he could understand everything. And he was like, I don't understand what's happening here could speak the mind of the person. How many immigrants come? And I will give a name, huh? Schwarzenegger. He comes, he learns, he adapts, he becomes a governor. Accepted, loved, of course. Some people always dislike you, but he's loved by many. Successful in so many ways. Adapted. As Darwin said, said he adapted. Deepak Chopra, he has deep accent in the language, but he's deeply accepted in the American culture in so many ways. So how does it happen? How do we do it? Emotional body language. It's beyond words. Jesus, the first thing that he told us without words was to be coherent. As mentor Joseph said to us in 2012, 
Strive to achieve coherence. Align your thoughts with your feelings, words, and actions. Coherence will give you greater peace of mind. Coherence leads us to consistency. That's why Andre Lewis, in the book Christian Agenda, says, A virtue is not a mouth that speaks, but a power that radiates. It's like you look at that person, you may not even understand what they're saying. But you know you get them. You get them. You like them. I don't know, right? <coughs> it's something that you radiate. So if we go back to science, science shows to us that in our normal communication, our emotional body language impacts more than words. If we sum up these two, it's more than words. So that's why you talk and you talk and people don't get it. Does that mean we're going to give stop the talks? No. That's the first pass. Like with our children, we're not going to talk. We will, but we need to align the other one to be make it strong. Say, don't drink, and you don't drink, wow, that's coherent. Study, and you study. Say, go do your homework, and you're watching TV. Don't use your tablet, and you're on the phone. And they're like, why? Why can't you do it and not me? Oh, because I'm the adult. Well, so we really have, don't eat sweets. And we're <coughs> eating all, the whole box of chocolate. And they're like, why should I eat carrots if you're, you, if you're not eating carrots? Because you're a child. You have to. And then when they grow those, say, you know what? Forget the carrots. My father never ate them or my mom never ate them, etc. So it's important to learn the coherence. So if we could share more of these nonverbal lessons in books, even by... Amelia Rodrigues through Divaldo Franco, besides the ones that I mentioned through Chico Xavier. And I even found books by non-spiritist uh, authors. Few, but some that are describing Jesus beyond words, his demeanor, his emotional body language, as we say. We are gonna observe these features. So if you wanna know more about what they are, it's about facial expression, silence, tone of voice, posture, smile, and embrace. Teasers for us. Jesus posture. For example, in this passage, they are discussing, they are talking about, you know, it's the Last Supper. He's saying this is going to happen and that and that. And, and they are already discussing. Well, if he's going to go away, who is going to come next? Who is going to rule? Who is going to lead? So they are arguing. Jesus doesn't say a word. He stands up, changes his robe to a servant's robe, takes a bowl of water, knees down, starts washing the feet. Of, as Daisy said, those feet must be very dirty because no bathroom no daily showers no soaps I mean you can only imagine it, it's not a trivial thing the washing of the feet it's deep this experience is deep and he goes there and washes and you think you're gonna go there and then you take a shower I know there's not even faucet for you to wash your hands that is extreme humbleness. And then he says, the one who serves the most is the one who is going to be the leader. But he shows first. He does it. And he's not saying, stop everybody. Look at this. Let me show you. No, no. he does it. And people are like, no, no, you're, and then Peter says, no, no, you're not going to wash my feet. <laughs> Always Peter. And then Jesus said, oh, you want to be more than your friends? Pride, right? You want to be more than them? 
always educating, by using words when they are needed. This is one of the scenarios, but if we go through different things, and this is just a teaser because we have many accounts and examples of his posture, we observe that Jesus sometimes had the posture that was says Humberto de Campos, a posture that is consoling. If I ask you as a, an exercise, make a posture that is consoling. And you're like, what is that? <laughs> consoling posture. And you're like, a, a consoling posture? How do I show consoling posture? One day I did this exercise, not precisely this, but an exercise of uh, reliability with medical students. I said, without words, you're going to pair up and be student and physician. And you needed to show that you are reliable. And they're like, how am I going to do this? I don't know. You figure it out without words. Huh? How, how do you show your patient that they can trust in you? How? Science shows that the first 90 or 120 seconds, you do this. In the first 90 to 100. It's like when you go to the doctor's office and the doctor is like this. Hi, please sit down, if they say it. Tell me what's going on. Or they sit next to you, not even in front of you. They are here, you're here. What's going on if you go to CVS Minute Clinic, right? I mean, they're adorable but that you're sitting next to them and they're like, the computer, they are looking at the computer and saying, what's going on? Oh, and how did this happen? Okay. <laughs> y you trust that doctor? You're like, oh my gosh, do they know what they're doing or not? And that's why they show that lots of the prescriptions, even in some hospitals, they did some research. People trash it out because they, they don't believe the doctor. The doctor say, take it. And they're like, I'm not going to take it. I don't think they, they got what I need. They didn't give me the medication I saw on Google. <laughs> <laughs> Google is more, uh, more of a doctor. <laughs> doctor Google. So how do you train yourself to show that you're reliable, that you're accountable, that you care, that you're consoling? Jesus is the master. When you read those books, you're going through a training. How can he be a model if he's not incarnated? Doesn't need to be incarnated. When we read, he said, I will send you the promised consoler that you teach you what I can teach you. In these teachings by Spiritism, you see the, the full description. Jesus was in his first appearance in Jerusalem, 30 years old. <coughs> Purposefully, he walks to Jerusalem and stands by the stairs of the temple. That has a meaning. He didn't enter the temple. And you're like, why not? He's Jewish. He has a divine mission. Shouldn't he preach inside? Well, wait for what's going to happen next. And the description of Humberto de Campos is such that when he is by the stairs, you can portray him because Humberto de Campos says he had a posture that was at the same time noble and simple. And you're like, noble and simple? What is to be noble and simple? It seems a paradox, right? Noble, simple. How can you do that? Leonardo da Vinci would know it because he would just say that the greatest complexities are in simplicity itself. The elegance of life is in simplicity because he could see the harmony of the forms. So we're talking about the form, the posture, the lesson. First, he doesn't enter the temple. Second, he is the Galilean. He's not dressed up as the Pharisees. So people know 
that he is of uh, another social, economic, intellectual class. But he has a noble, noble, and simple. See, Jesus is so different. Still puzzling. So intriguing. What an intriguing teacher. But then in the dialogue he has with the Pharisees that comes, especially Hannah, he comes and says, Hey, Galilean, what have you come here for? And in this noble and simple, and then the di dialogue describes the tone of voice, lessons in between the lines. It says, I have come to implement the kingdom of God on earth. If he had entered the temple, or what would you, would you conclude? That the kingdom of God is implemented in the temple, in the church. And that's big. But he did. Showing to us that it's not in a temple, in a spirit center, or in a church. And then Hannah asks, and uh, how do you think you're going to do this? So the dialogue goes on and on, and it's beautiful in so many lessons, verbal, nonverbal. And at some point, and he says, where are you going to do this? In the hearts of people, so not in the temple. That's why you don't need to go to the temple. So powerful. He is saying to us, it's not anywhere. It's within you. Our dear Umberto de Campos describes in other instances that he has an unforgettable posture. What is an unforgettable posture? It depends, right? But what is it? Charismatic. That we can imagine. So in the book Good News, like in the example we just gave to you about the temple and being by the stairs, Boa Nova, Good News, Humberto de Campos describes to us that Jesus taught us the pathway beyond words because at the end of the day, he's teaching us the divine kingdom is within the heart of each person. That's the posture. Now the nonverbal lesson through the look. We observe throughout these books through Chico Xavier that Jesus sometimes had a firm look. Can you imagine that? Loving look. Can you imagine that? Because usually we'll think of Jesus as somebody who's judging us, who's stern. But we've never found that Jesus in the literature, the descriptions. We found a lucid look, one that was illuminated, attentive, a master that pays attention to us. He was not a master like, you pay attention to me and I don't care who you are. Because many masters and gurus are like this. I'm the center of attention. I don't care who you are. But Jesus wasn't like this. He was like, I love you. You matter. 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 Everybody matters. No matter where you come from. And people are upset. Like, no. Everybody matters. No way. So he was attentive. He had a soft look. He had a bright look. I could give you scenarios, but because of time we have to cut short. Maybe another time we're going to study more so of the scenarios. I'll leave it to some of other very important messages. Jesus silence. In our current society in the Western world, it's probably one of the messages that we need the most so hard some cultures are good at silence but our western societies are so bad on silence we're not only loud but we're relentless it's impossible to just be next to one another and be we oh my gosh what do i say i have to say something if i don't say anything that means i'm stupid i don't know that means nothing. Just be. And Jesus was like this. 
you see in the book Jesus in the home the description people were talking for hours and he was there paying attention listening to the point he would say can you tell us something about this <laughs> and yet he would wait sometimes Neil Lucio describes a long pause because he was making people think but much more than that so Umberto de Campos comes and says that Jesus had different silences, and we would say in psychoanalysis, especially when we study a particular field that we call psychoanalysis of language with uh, Jacques Lacan, we learn about the power of silence. Sometimes it's more powerful than words. It can be very revealing, can hurt, it can be very embracing. It has a lot of meaning. In Jesus' case, he had the silence of reflection in which he would meditate and allow people to meditate. I'll give an example. One example. Umberto de Campos describes, and I, I turn it off just so we focus. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so, I it's so still okay. So Jesus was there, and then somebody comes and the disciples say oh this is a personality he's looking for you he's so excited to be a disciple and jesus says yeah, he welcomes him and waits and the man starts talking i see this da -da -dee, da -da -da, and jesus listens 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 doesn't say anything the man looks at him, sees his, that he's not going to say anything, leaves, and doesn't believe that he is the Messiah at all. What kind of Messiah is this that doesn't say a word? But kindly, let's give a comparison here. Take a walk and go to a psychiatric hospital. That's the exercise of psychiatrists sometimes. They sit down and listen, 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 listen. Say, okay, okay, see you tomorrow. The person doesn't want to do, to do the dialogue. Sometimes they just need a mirror that shows them where, we, where they are. Sometimes our children, they may come and, I'm so upset, da, 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 da. it's useless they are in their mind when you understand where they are or a student they want to cry or a patient they want to cry let them cry out and out that doesn't mean you don't care that means that time it's about them speaking anything you say it's fruitless it's like a plant and water you put water and you wait and the plant is there. But if you put more water now, it's going to spoil it. Sometimes water, like too much water, it can spoil the plant. But if we don't say the words at the right time either, we can kill the plant. It can dry it out. It's when we learn in psychology the negative power of neglect. When people neglect affection, and they literally kill people. In orphanages in uh, Russia, they did those studies and showed that the children that didn't have this input, they were neglected, they died. We are to be nourished, but properly. So Jesus shows to us that sometimes it's a silence to allow to reflect or to avoid confrontation. Thinking before replying, he often had a pause. We've never heard in any story Jesus napping. Stop everybody, I already know the answer. No, 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 he would wait or he would make a pause. Exercises we can do. Sometimes you're anxious, like, I have to say something. I have to do something. Breathe. 
Dr. Bert, um, Herbert Burns Benson at Harvard teaches about relaxation breathing, abdominal breathing, four, seven, eight, four, inhaling, seven, holding, eight, exhaling. People are talking, breathing. Nobody have to say so. Breathe, easy, don't. You're already saying, paying attention. Sometimes you're talking to people, they're looking at your earring, your hair, your clothes, your stuff. And they, I mean, they're not listening. But Jesus is looking in the eyes and waiting. But the most fascinating part that we discover in the spiritist studies, of all things, I would say the two highlights of the nonverbal lessons, which are very surprising, that the spirits reveal through many mediums, is that Jesus was a smiling master. Maybe that's why he got on the nerves. He was too happy, too joyful. This is one of the pictures that is in the movie, The Passion of the Christ, that maybe comes close to how we, we could portray him smiling. And the qualities and features of this smile, he's so emotionally fit, intelligent, masterful, that he could customize smiles. And we're not saying this in a manipulative way, but in an educational way, as a therapist, as a brother, as a friend, he had different smiles. Umberto de Campos describes that sometimes he had a serene smile. That's a hard smile. Make a serene smile. What's a serene smile? I want to smile in this serene smile. Look in the mirror and try <laughs> it. And then, oh no, it didn't work yet. <laughs> Right? Benign smile. Wow, that's powerful. Benign. It does good without words. Loving smile, calm smile, because usually we associate joy with craziness, going wild, losing our minds. That's why many people believe that if you smile too much, it's bad. Generous smile. What is a generous smile? Elegant smile. But sincere, huh? Not like royalty smile. Like, you know, when people scientifically, if you want to know if people are smiling sincerely, it's not as beautiful as you see in the photo books. Because if you don't wrinkle here, it's not a sincere smile. So scientists already know the behavioral scientists already know they can look at people and see sincere or not sincere. Mm -hmm. If it wrinkles here, you say, oh, sincere. If they... <laughs> <laughs> it's just for Hollywood. You know, red carpet smile. <laughs> right? Sincere smile, friendly smile. It's interesting because in each occasion there is a story that portrays that smile fitting that scenario as a learning lesson. So we would encourage us, when we go back to all these books, have these books, Emmanuel's novels, Jesus in the Home, Boa Nova Good News. Go there. Pay attention to that scenario, because there's a lot of lesson there that we skip, because we go straight to the words. But before the words, and Bigger than the wor words is the emotional body language. Maybe that's why we still don't understand Jesus. Because we're still paying attention to the 7% we can grasp the words. But look at what he's done. And his embrace to hug people all that is a novelty. Because nowadays we're in this conflicted era in which if people hug, they must know they are womanizing, they they want they want something sexual, they are manipulating, but Jesus would embrace 
in a loving therapeutic care, but he would 2,000 years ago. He's ahead of the time. And Umberto de Campos in different scenarios shows to us particularities of this embrace. There are tender embrace, loving embrace, and meek embrace. These are just teasers for us because we don't have to time, time to go through. We needed a whole course to go through each and every feature to study these nonverbal lessons. But the mentors wants us to enter this Christmas by first visualizing Jesus embracing us. How often we see Jesus there and we're here. Bring him closer. Allow him to embrace because he would hug us. He would. He kissed, he hugged, he smiled. A true master. Second, when we read it again, allow him to coach ourselves by paying attention to these descriptions before we read the words. So we can adjust ourselves, become more congruent. left and Zacchaeus was crazy like oh my gosh everybody like when we're waiting for a visit right we have to clean and to cook and but Umberto de Campos describes something that is fascinating he waited for Zacchaeus to climb down thank you Daisy thank you so much thank you he climbs down Jesus waits and walks with him to his home. But how does he do it? Umberto de Campos in the book of News describes that they walk like this. You're Jesus, I am. Okay. So it's on you, the posture. I can do any posture. <laughs> <laughs> and they were behind and Uberto de Campos describes Jesus smiling and and they were not best friends I mean in the sense of like it was the first time they met and people disliked that publican because he was a tax collector he took people's money and they were outraged even the disciples they were like I don't believe it And then at some point when they get to the house and Zacchaeus is busy organizing the family and the servants, Peter questions Jesus. And it's interesting to see the description that the disciple is questioning the master and how he replies and his body language and the description of how embracing he is of this man. This is Jesus. He loves us. 
He embraces us, no matter what we have done this far. If we, like Zacchaeus, want to shift gears, he's going to say, come with me. And he walks side by side with us. He said he won't stop until the last sheep is rescued none of us will be astray. He customizes his lessons for us. This is our master. So let us feel tonight this customized embrace. He knows us and he cares He has everything ready for us. It's up to us, as Daisy said, if we're ready for him. He's waiting. Emmanuel says he's waiting. Do we accept it or not? Let us receive the passes and visualize throughout his embrace. His embrace, his embrace. Okay. We're going to dim the lights. Thank you, John. <laughs>